genital. <laughs> Good evening. This is the Wednesday, November 13th, uh, 2019 meeting of the Moscow um, Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, calling the meeting to order. Um, the first item is approval of the minutes from October 23rd. Does anybody have any comments or additions, deletions? Okay. Uh, move to approve. Well, oh. I do have one. Okay. <laughs> I was waiting to see if anybody else. I just had a question in item three under the public hearing uh, in the italicized portion, the last sentence. The commission is proposing to eliminate this requirement. Um, wait a minute. Let me put my, I'm sorry. No, it's the one below it. I need to put my glasses on. Um, the, the first printed line below that, or second one, Grop asked if gas and sewer can be separate for ADUs. And I was thinking we should probably put the response to that question in there, maybe. Do you think? That, yes, that it's just for clarification. Or, or there wasn't any discussion after that. As oh, there, I there wasn't? OK. There I, was, I just, was trying to was, remember it. There was an answer to the question, which was, it's automatic. Uh, it's automatic. So maybe Mike said something. Was I that? think you did. Yeah. So maybe it's not necessary, but it, it was just a comment. I heard it did kind of hang. Okay. Um, I don't know. I mean, I hate it. it I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't see it till today, and I was reading it, and I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I have a question. Mm -hmm. So on the on the miniature golf. We're not doing four spaces per hole, but one and a half. Is it one and a half or one? I don't remember. Um, we, Mike would know. Uh, I think it's one. That's space what I thought. Yeah. 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 Okay, so where are you, what page are you? Oh, it's now? on the first page. It's under number four in the italics, the last sentence of the italics, where it says uh, required parking for manager golf facilities from four per hole to one and a half, and I thought it was one. Okay, so that's that would be a correction. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, anybody else? All right. Do I hear? Um, Move to approve okay. with Thank you corrections. Much. And is there second. a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Extensions? All right. Thank you. Um, Moving on, for those of you in the audience who are learning about these meetings, uh, an architecture student and a landscape architecture student, um, this is uh, um, a time for members of the public to speak to the commission about matters that aren't we're not considering tonight, um, um, and or, or pending in, in, uh, before us. And so we, in, this is a time when members of the public sometimes come up and talk to us about other things. So um, tonight, other than you two, and I don't, I'm assuming you're taking notes, but you're not here to speak. Um, there, uh, there is, and I don't mean to scare you. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, that's, uh, that's what this time is set aside for. Okay, so item three is final review of draft ordinance regarding manufactured homes and RV parks. And Mike Ray is going to do a presentation on that. Yeah, so this has uh, been in the legal department being reviewed uh, for the last couple months. And so uh, me had a chance to, to take a look at it and made uh, quite a few kind of minor modifications to the code. Uh, but I'll give a little recap as to the major changes that occurred. So we have uh, really the merging of those two chapters. We had the existing uh, mobile home park chapter and the new mobile home park chapter, and those were merged into one. Uh, and then we had uh, the RV park uh, code as mm -hmm. well, which was added on. Uh, within the mobile home park uh, ordinance, so we renamed that to manufactured home uh, park ordinance to be consistent with just updated terminology. Uh, there was updated definitions, so manufactured home uh, was consistent with the state definition, so that was updated. Uh, mobile home as well, and then we added modular home, um, which is a different uh, <coughs> really housing type other than a manufactured or mobile home. It can be uh, constructed and it's usually inspected by Idaho Division of Building Safety and certified, but it's similar to a manufactured or mobile home. Uh, and then updated manufactured home park to include all three of those, so manufactured, mobile, and modular. And then throughout, uh, like I mentioned before, mobile home has been changed to manufactured home uh, through the document. And then looking through the uh, entitlement process, looking at preliminary and final plats, uh, we just updated that for digital submission requirements. 
Uh, in, back in the day, we'd require five paper copies, but um, now we just essentially require uh, digital submission. And then eliminated detailed internal review that didn't really need to be stated. Uh, there was some awkward language about forwarding uh, recommendation to council, uh, but final approval would be P&Z similar to RV parks. Uh, and then we have different standards. Uh, there was a, in, a uh, heading inserted for bulk and dimensional. So we added uh, two categories. So this was kind of the merging of the old and the new. Um, this is the, the one area of the, the new ordinance where there's a distinction between uh, old and new parks. Uh, but we essentially have um, you know, different setback standards for older parks. Uh, they're usually quite a bit smaller than um, you know some of the newer ones in town and uh, usually what you look for is just separation between different manufactured homes as well as the property lines uh, and then not encroaching on the internal drive that uh, circulates through the park and so those are the primary things that are contained within uh, that section and then there are a number of standards um, they really weren't called standards, so we restructured those. There was recreation area, buffer area, streets and roads, private streets, walkways, lighting, parking, utilities, uh, handling of refuse, space numbering, and skirting requirements that were all kind of separated there. And then we added the modular homes um, and just adding that uh, you know, modular homes that have been inspected and approved by DBS, which contain appropriate modular insignia, shall be permitted within manufacturer home parks, uh, just to be clear on our intent there. And then we got to the RV park code. We added the definition of a park model RV, which uh, you're starting to see a lot more of the tiny home uh, models. Those are typ typically referred to as park model RVs. Um, and so we added that underneath the definition of RVs. Uh, we essentially matched the state definition there, as well as updated a number of other definitions to match state definitions. And then went through, similar to the manufactured home park ordinance, um, went through and updated just the preliminary final plat submittal requirements to require electronic. Uh, and then the, you know, the main highlight was the change from the current limitation of six months stay uh, for RVs in an RV park and the Commission wanted to eliminate the length of stay um, and just really make it indefinite and that's just for RVs with full hookups of course uh, and then there was some discussion before and um, you know we talked about that and ended up inserting the requirement for RVs to be owner occupied within a park and so that was really the only thing um, through the proposed changes that our city attorney uh, had a little bit of concern with um, was drawing that distinction between uh, you know RVs that are owner occupied and, and ones that you know an RV park owner may um, you know purchase to set in a park to to be able to rent out on a short term basis and uh, she just had a couple questions that really wanted to have a little bit of internal discussion about just you know the concerns of the commission and typically there has to be some type of you know, overall government interest in implementing kind of those regulations. And so that was one thing that uh, she just, you know, wanted a little bit more clarification on or discussion as to why if you were, you know, anybody in an RV park that ended up, uh, you know, setting their RV in the park and it was, they owned it, um, how that would be different than uh, an RV park owner, you know, setting multiple RVs and, and allowing somebody to uh, essentially rent those RVs out. Do you think there's a parallel with our ADU ordinance? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we limit those to owners. And that's the only, to, yeah, um, and that, that's the only other portion of our code where we draw that distinction and limit it to owner occupancy. Uh, there, I think the government interest is just protecting more of the single-family nature of the neighborhood. Um, but in a way, it's a still a neighborhood and a community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if you uh, have an RV person who owns all the trailers and you rent your site from them, that's like having an apartment owner who rents out apartments, but you don't have a lot of apartments don't allow subletting because you know you don't want to wind up with weird situations and what we didn't want is 
for people to have rentals that just turn into slums. And I don't know how you want to deal with the government. But you could, yeah. Point. I mean, it, it it parallels a manufactured parallels. home park right. because you could have the same scenario. I mean, a lot of times the manufactured home park owner will own multiple oh, manufactured homes within the park and rent mm -hmm. those out. Mm -hmm. um, where, uh, you know, and vice versa, there, there's a lot of people that uh, own their manufactured home and they just pay a lot to uh, lease, you know, or rent for the park. Well, the other and complication so that I thought of associated with this potentially is um, if, which I think would be a typical situation, uh, Parents have a, a, a kid who's coming to school here, so they buy them a RV, and technically the kid living in the RV doesn't own the <laughs> RV his parents do or her parents do. So that that would be another, I was wondering how we deal with that, you know, would it just be the same family name or, or the parents have to sign the lease? I mean, it's kind of related in, in terms of mm. Um, not being owner occupied anyway. Yes, I mean technically, exactly. Yeah. And I mean it would be a, a challenge, you know, a bit of a challenge to enforce to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Um, we would just have to provide right. some type of, ti you know, title documentation mm -hmm. as to mm -hmm. uh, who the owner of the RV is. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I don't understand enough about the problems that happened at um, Syringa. <laughs> I mean, how many of those were owner occupied and? But Syringa was just was a it wasn't a mobile home park. It was. We it was. We're talking about RV. We're talking yeah, about, we're RVs. about RVs. It's but a mobile home park, but but it's the RV. same type of problem when. I mean, in a way, I, I I don't know what the ownership pattern was there. Well, I think a lot of the people yeah. owned the their mobile homes there but they were older right mm -hmm. so the the park's been around for quite a long time and so a lot of the mobile homes were substandard yeah. were they met the definition of a mobile home so they predated the uh like sev the 76 cutoff mm -hmm. and so in order to move those to another park say in the city they'd be required to rehabilitate them mm -hmm. and, and which could be a substantial cost and then the cost of moving them yeah. uh, isn't cheap as well so, so the problem wasn't that the the owner of the of the park owned a lot of units and pe and rented them out. The problem was that they were just substandard because they were built before 1976. I, I think uh, the the age of a lot of them was yeah. the main issue. I don't know for sure how many he actually owned or not in the park, but yeah. I know that um, just working with trying to get people relocated with their mobile homes was a challenge, and there was only a handful of them that ended up moving from. Um, Syringa right. into, into the city and it was mainly just because of the rehabilitation requirement <coughs> because they mm -hmm. predated the cutoff uh, for manufactured home. I'm inclined to think that the issue with these uh, dwelling uh, systems are management and I, I'm inclined to think that uh, we wouldn't don't need to say that they need to be owner uh, mm -hmm. dwelled in. I, it just seems to me that, uh, and and I I wasn't uh, I didn't work with the people at Syringa or anything though I've had several friends who lived out there and it just seemed to me like the death of Syringa was just bad management and mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, you. I mean, the same thing would go with any trailer, uh, a park, any manufactured home park, and those that are well managed don't have problems. Yeah. And those, if you don't have any management at all, which I think, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it didn't look like Syringa had management in the last 10, mm -hmm. 15 years of its, because uh, it started as a very bright, moment it was going to be a wonderful place a, a good place to live with swimming pool and playgrounds and all that sort of stuff and then it just didn't get managed so i'm not sure that this yeah. ownership thing is a, a really an issue yeah, I, I see what you're saying do, but do you feel that there's a need to limit the number i mean 
just should have acres and acres when and acres of RVs. When you see Robinson, uh, that yeah. th as big as that park was, as big as that, just seems like it really works. Mm -hmm. And we all know that uh, Jim Robinson, at least for many, many years, it was just a well-managed deal. And uh, so I don't know. I, I, I don't have that. I've never lived in one, but people lived out there for years. But uh, don't you most people own their own um, home right. there? Yeah, I mean. Probably do, but yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't know how many, or, I don't know, that might be worth asking, how it's many a, rental yeah. units are, are out there. It's a mixture. There's a mixture. Yeah. You know, I, one of Mike's points, and I, I think it factors into this, and I'm inclined to agree with what Nels is talking about, but enforcement. I mean, we're, we're going to put right, a regulation gotcha. in there, and, and the it's only way game. enforcement yeah. really, it's kind of like with the ADUs, it gets enforced if there's a complaint, but beyond that, there's no real or enforcement mechanism. Ownership. So, I, and I agree with, with what you are saying. Mm -hmm. I, my inclination at this point is to say, yeah, why? What's well, the point in requiring it? So, well, I think what we're getting yes, at is that we want you know a certain aesthetic and and a certain quality to you know what we see in RV parks or manufactured home parks and the roundabout way of trying to achieve that in a better way is you know having that owner you know thinking that the owner um, of the RV would take better care of you know the park owner having a bunch of RVs and that may not always be the case and maybe it's a statement about um, just how you know maybe just the care that uh, or the shape that a lot of these units are in and have to be well maintained you know something statement about being well maintained um, you know along those lines it might just yeah. well it <coughs> and, to, and to follow up with your statement this this requirement is a by the RV requirement. We're written into the draft already. The responsibility of the vehicle park owner already addresses that on a park level. It you know the equipment must be in good repair, clean, and sanitary condition. And they talk about the park, its facilities, and equipment. So here we put the onus of our concerns onto the park owner. Mm -hmm. And instead of a by the RV, I think this probably does a very good job of mm -hmm. achieving what we're trying to achieve here. And to, add, yeah. it, it, uh, to add to it, it, if this, if we were living in Flagstaff, Arizona, we might have a different issue. Thousands of people come to Flagstaff every year, every month, every day to go to Grand Canyon. And they leave and you, and in, in, in <laughs> April. <laughs> an RV park probably with yeah. uh, 40 or 50, 60 units in them. Here, no one comes to Moscow, <laughs> give me a break. Uh, you can't get your relatives to come and visit you. Uh, you know, uh, you have to wave a sign, Hunga Dunga, come, come and go to Hunga Dunga and we'll have, uh, go to the Wilson place uh, to eat. Uh, they don't. <laughs> so it just seems to me that it isn't an issue. And, and, and the less rules we can put on stuff probably yeah. is okay by me. Yeah. <laughs> no, this one I think would be difficult to enforce. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably so. Was there it's anything, I can't recall, like, did that come somehow from the discussion of eliminating the six month uh, maximum? Did, was that I don't somehow? Remember. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. just wondering if there was some reason, like, okay, well, if we do away with this yeah. and say there's no maximum right. then maybe we should yep. say this what was that connection because well, there is I remember some discussion on you know you have people who live there on a permanent basis and they don't want to have somebody moving in next door to them that are showing up for the big games and parties Right, yeah. so I think when there was the six well, month limitation, that might that, have been it. Um, then oh, yeah, that, yeah. That's you wouldn't end up with a point, but 
mostly the people who come for games are here for two days. Mm -hmm. I mean, they hit the parking lot or, and uh, or blast semester, out of town the Or next semester morning. or whatever. But you, I think part of the concern was so that other people didn't find their peace and quiet in their property uh, impinged upon by... Well, I think it, there was or the discussion revolved around whether, whether it should be a permanent housing solution or not. Really, yeah, Scott was um, concerned. I think Scott was the one that brought it up. Concerned over, um, you know, when you have this intermingling of like the avial scenario, where you have the intermingling of manufactured homes with the introduction of RVs, and how um, some people in manufactured homes may not look too kindly on having a permanent RV sitting right you know right. next door because they have to put skirts around their buildings and and you know i mean it's a different <coughs> with an rv it's different <laughs> but they better do the same thing yeah, yeah. Or, or else, else it's gonna freeze absolutely yeah. <coughs> so that's a from what i recall that was you know his concern was that you know the intermingling of the manufactured homes and introduction of rvs uh in those parks you could see a, some negative effects if somebody had a, you know, a park owner decided to to rent out a number of them that he acquired. And they're smaller parcels, and they're closer together, and yeah, they're different. You know, the we we tend to use well, there's Syringa on one side and, and and on Almond, the Robinson Park on the other, but there's another unit pl park down on Palouse, and there's a one out on the old. Pullman Highway going out of town. And on uh, Oak Street, okay. it's, yeah. I, I, if you want to see something a little different, I would um, recommend that you take a drive out on the old uh, highway uh, one day and just uh, drive uh, through that. Uh, uh, park. It's a little. It's not. It uh, it isn't quite the same as um, the Robinson. So once again, management seems to be the deal. Uh, I mean, it, when you, w we just naturally say, well, we don't want so and so living next to us. But on the other hand, uh, gosh, we've got all over town. We've got rental units <laughs> yeah. uh, that are not being well managed and uh, and uh, so we're putting a different onus on these folks that we don't even have in our own uh, uh, town. The folks uh, buy, somebody in California buys a house next to you and the next thing you know it's a different, a slightly <laughs> different world. So well, I, 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 anyway, I, I think that's probably I've, I've said enough about it, but it just doesn't seem to me to be a, an issue at this point. Okay. Well, what was the city attorney's concerns, Mike? Uh, it was just primarily just demonstrating kind of that, you know, what would be the significant government interest in having that regulation. Yeah. So. And that was really, I mean, I, just listening to the discussion and not really hearing one, I, I mean, that was kind of what she, where she was coming from was um, just really what are the you know primary concerns and and what would be the kind of justification for us. To I think it was quality control. You know, I mean, yeah. it was yeah. trying to protect yeah. the permanent residents yeah. um, when when from what I recall of the discussion. But yeah. You know. So what do we what do we do if if is would a motion to move to strike that would that be well the, what uh, would be the I think we just it's a working document it's so we can just we can, I do yeah. have a question if you roll back one slide maybe yeah. um, I think it's one slide um, so is there any reason not or or I guess in the adding definition of um, park model RV and, and also known as tiny homes, is there any reason why we wouldn't want to put tiny homes also in there as a... Um, yeah, I had the same question. Yeah, because it's becoming a pretty standard, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's being used quite a bit as, um, in other jurisdictions, or would it, would it make sense to do that? I'm not bleeding. You think? I, I do, because if you don't, then people are going to say, where's the tiny home? You haven't covered right. tiny homes. Right, right. And I think it needs to be there. And I wouldn't, I honestly would look at a park model RV and not think of it I as a tiny home right off my, right off 
the bat. So, I well, I mean, there there could be different variations of tiny homes. So, like the mo the modular building, yeah, right? True. That could be true. a tiny home. It's just not on wheels. True. So, um, I mean, the the tiny homes, you know, if they're on wheels and a chassis, it just automatically gets grouped as an RV because they're they fit the, the state code and they have to be licensed through the DMV. Um, I still would put in such as tiny homes or something like that because otherwise I don't think anybody's going to pick up on that. But you're saying there's a st actually a state definition of a park model RV. Do you know what it is? Yeah, it's right. It's in the code. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 what page? Because I was looking. At it. Let's see. So maybe it's there. Maybe it's not working yet. Uh. Well, I'm not sure where it is exactly. Yet. Um. <coughs> That's all the definition parts. Is it towards the end? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So you're saying it would appear in all the categories, so it's kind of hard. So it needs to almost be a definition of its. Yeah, it's on uh, page 16 of the ordinance. Okay. All right, camping trail. Oh, okay, gotcha. I mean, we could even say this could include tiny home, a cabin. And yeah. I mean, it could be at the very end. Yeah. At the and certain tiny homes. I mean, I don't want yeah. to include all of them. Right, right. I see what you're saying. And, and yeah. certain tiny homes. That uh huh. Yeah. Just, that would work. Yeah, I think that I think that would be good to have. So. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have any other comments or questions? Well, it's good to have that oversight because we talk in context, in depth, a mm -hmm. long time, and go through all this stuff, and then you go back to it later, or somebody with fresh eyes looks at it, mm -hmm. and you get a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah, a legal perspective, which <laughs> well, is probably pretty in important. Case, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, so is that pretty much everything? Yeah, for that I, category? I was, yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so then we were just looking at maybe noticing it for public hearing December 11th, oh, which will okay. be our next meeting. Okay. And so you said this doesn't come to city council, right? The ordinance will. Oh, okay. But not the, um, so if somebody applies for a new manufactured home park or an RV park, it typically doesn't go to council. So we're we going to strike the owner occupied and we're going to put in that that's this right. could yep. include tiny homes. Yep, homes that's what I have. Okay. Sounds okay. good. Sounds good. All right. Okay. Get it? Mm -hmm. All right. So we'll we'll have it as in public hearing form next time. Um, okay. Item four: review of draft sign code tables. And Mike Ray is going to present on that too. Just take one more. Oops, sorry. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> we had a good format before. So. so yeah, this is our um, our work to put in uh, all the regulations. So right now we, like you know, we have it in the uh, two column narrative format, and we were just going through and and um, putting it in a table format. So we can start out with commercial zones. So the way we have it right now is they're just kind of grouped. So, um, and we didn't really deviate from that at all just because it saves on the number of columns that you're required to have. If we list all the different zones, uh, I don't think there's enough distinction between some of these zones to warrant different regulations. So we just kept uh, the categories or the groupings that um, we currently have. 
And so we go through permitted signs and commercial zones, um, freestanding signs, go through maximum square footage, uh, height, number of signs permitted, setbacks from property line, minimum clearance above the driveway if it's applicable, and then uh, just state the, the various requirements underneath each zone. There are some of these between, you know, zo some zones call out specific requirements and some zones don't. And so we're still kind of going through this and taking a look at whether or not it makes sense to just leave some of those blank or, or actually fill them in with requirements. And I think we'll go through and probably try to fill in some of the blanks. Um, but we go through, so, and then we go down to monument signs, um, same thing. I think some of these, they're kind of open-ended. So there, there's one that, that says that you're allowed to have one monument or freestanding sign. And then it goes through the regulations and, and just lists the maximum size for the freestanding sign. So I don't know if it was on purpose that they didn't <laughs> list any maximum size requirements for monument, but uh, it doesn't make any sense why you would have restrictions or limitations on like a freestanding signs and, and not on a monument sign. So um, in those circumstances, we've just been going through and, and trying to look at what makes sense as far as the signage. But um, yeah, similar, just going through monument signs. Um, motor business and industrial zones. We may take a look at this section. So essentially what happens is you're allowed a larger sign once you get 10 feet back from the property line. And it's always been a little confusing. And I, you know, the intent I think is just to, um, you know, with monument signs, they're closer to the ground. They don't, they're not really up on a single pole. Uh, 25 feet in the air like your typical freestanding sign and I think the major concern is more just sight distance you know safety with with oncoming traffic um, so you know we'll take I think we'll take a look at that but um, I don't really like having kind of the, the formula and then going at the very end like we have footnotes uh, at the very bottom where you have to end up looking at uh, you know the different requirements and, and trying to calculate it that way so we may look at trying to simplify that while still maybe um, keeping, you know, the kind of the safety issue, you know, at the forefront. But it's, you know, it's 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 pretty simple as far as just taking what what we have in the text and and taking a look at that. Um, probably what I'll have you do is just look through some of these on your own time and just go through and and take a look and see if it makes sense to you if there's something that jumps out as far as you know why is in this zone why is it allowed to be this large or you know why is it you're not you're not allowed to have a certain type of signage in this uh, in this zone um, roof signs for instance um, I think we'll go either leave these blank or I think I'll define this acronym somewhere. So this is not permitted. Uh, the only time we have a um, roof science allowed in the motor business and industrial zones. So what if, um, I guess we don't really have that circumstance, but I'm thinking in some historic districts, you see old signs up on roofs. Uh -huh. um, so that wouldn't be permitted in our central business district then. Currently not permitted. I mean, you have the historic. I'm trying to think if we <laughs> have any the historic wall do. signs. I think uh, what Brown's mm -hmm. furniture yeah, is the, one, the one that comes to mind. Um, but we don't really have that many roof signs. Mm -hmm. uh, Alpine Vet Clinic, I believe, on um, I think it's Lily Logan Street. Or Lily, yeah. Cedar. There's a cedar. Cedar Vet. They have uh, they have a roof sign. That, that's uh. kind of one of the only ones. Yes, we went Mr. Windshield. Yeah, still still there. Hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, in the Moscow Hotel. Is hmm. there one? Yeah. It's still there. I'm not sure. <laughs> Don't I pay attention up I at that think, angle. Yeah, I think it's inside <laughs> in the garden area. No, yeah, it is. I think it's it's, when they, it's they on the wall. Yeah, yeah, in the garden. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Probably so maybe there aren't any, but uh, but also mm -hmm. the yeah. Those <laughs> So, I mean, it'd, yeah. it'd probably be good at this time to take a look and see if we want to change any of that. I mean, I, I really nothing stands out to me as to, 
why we wouldn't allow a roof sign in central business. What is the uh, <coughs> treatment of billboards? It seems to me we, uh, many years ago, we did something about to regulate spacing of billboards and we, yeah, it, it's it's currently in the code, and um, we're going to have to address. Yeah, we haven't got to that. We're, we're going to have to address it. Right now, we call it a freestanding sign, and the way we have it currently in the code is a, a little odd because it's still called a freestanding sign, and you can't have. It, it's like in the a third or fourth paragraph of the freestanding sign section, only in motor business and, and industrial are the only zones they're allowed. Um, there has to be a certain amount of separation between another billboard. I think it's maybe yeah. 300 to 500 feet. Um, and right now, there I think the you know the Supreme Court case. There's other cases that are coming forward. Um, so that this is the off-premise or on-premise discussion on whether or not we can regulate off-premise or on-premise types. You can draw that distinction. Um, because all billboards are essentially off-premise signs because they advertise something that's not right. on that property. Um, so we're still looking at that. I think there was another court case recently um, that expanded on the Supreme Court case decision to say that there may be an issue with regulating kind of the off-premise type signs. But we'll have to, yeah, we'll, we'll I don't think we're going to call them a, a, uh, a freestanding sign anymore. I think we'll probably call them a billboard to make it <coughs> clear. But, um, but yeah, it, it's just, it's one that we'll have to make a decision. You know, a lot of, you know, what we've been trying to do is kind of incrementally reduce the number that we have in town. There was right. one on a, a portion of, uh, by Troy Highway and, and White Avenue right there I guess to right away intersection that um, we had acquired that property because that's where the path goes and there was a billboard on there and they had a, maybe a 20 30 year lease and that lease you know ended up expiring and uh, we told them to to remove it and so we had you know pretty much removed that one but there aren't a whole lot of other opportunities based upon our current code uh, for billboards, I, I think there was a company that was looking around um, this last <coughs> year, and there was only a few locations um, where they could put put a billboard. But the uh, 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 on the well, how big is the billboard? Uh, you got 120 square feet. Uh, getting close to a billboard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we go through the freestanding sign section. Um, freestanding signs are usually limited to 100 square feet. They can have another 100 square feet for a certain amount of landscaping around the base. And then if there's multiple entities on the freestanding sign, they can go all the way up to 300 square feet is the, the maximum that we have. Um, and then we go on to say that an additional freestanding sign, and then in parentheses, billboard, may be permitted to exceed 100 square feet of sign area exclusive of increases, uh, multiple entities or landscaping, provided such freestanding sign meets the following requirements. It has to be on a lot, at least 2,500 square feet in size. Uh, it's located on property within 50 feet of US Highway 95 or State Highway 8. It'd be spaced no more than a 1,500 feet of another sign permitted in this section. That's the billboards? Uh-huh. Yeah, that makes more sense than 300. And then it not exceed 300 square feet per facing with no more than two facings that intersect at no greater than 135 degree angle. Can't exceed 25 feet in height. Uh, if illuminated, the source of illumination be external, not directly visible from any location on adjacent lot or right away. Maintain a minimum clear distance of eight feet from the bottom of the sign of the ground below it, or a minimum of 14 feet of the ground below if it's a driveway. I have a question about that illumination thing. Is it so where it says the source of illumination shall not be visible from any adjoining street or property? Is the source, in the case of a sign that is not externally illuminated, is the source the sign itself then? 
if it's like a neon sign or a you know a sign that's lit, is that the source and it's not supposed to be visible from any adjoining that, property? That's what we call internal. Internal. Yeah. So right. there's internal and external, and this one yeah. just says that. But it says the source of illumination shall not be visible from any adjoining. And that's on. Ex oh, that's, that's only that's external, right? So yeah. that's only referring to external. Those so are only referring to external. Got it. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So you see, I mean, a lot of them. Okay. Especially okay. subdivisions or uh, animal clinic is kind of yeah. an example because I drive by all the time. That they typically have rocks. You know, if they have a sign the on the lighting. ground, it's pointing up at the sign. Then they usually surround it by kind of boulders or something. Just, just so you're, dr you're the, driving, yeah. you're not getting the, right. you know, yeah. really the that the point of, of illumination. But. Didn't we at some time also have a uh, uh, prohibition against? Uh, uh, Active signs, uh, signs yeah. that. Uh, there oh, yeah. there was well, when the tri-state sign yeah. on, you mean? Yeah, there was the whole uh, the thing that came sign. to the council yeah. on exigency yeah. for safety because yeah. it was a, a a hazard for drivers. Right. To have, a have to too me. much light <laughs> yeah. or too much activity, and then yeah. miss the pedestrian and miss the bikers. And, you know. Yeah, that that was with yeah the tri-state yeah. sign. Yeah. So that we call those dynamic display signs. Right. And um, so we, we have yeah we, we, we went through those regulations. Yeah. We ended but up. I think um, we I think we also applied that to billboards. Billboards came up. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have any, but there was one that was just outside based of upon our dynamic display regulations. Um, you know, if they were to do a billboard, it could only be, I think, 100 square feet in size. And yeah, they wouldn't be able to have any uh, animations. But let's see. Yeah, maximum size of a single dynamic display sign is 100 square feet in motor business. So if you're looking at maybe the typical billboard that's 300 square feet in size, you know, it either had to be substantially less or they could only do the dynamic display on a portion of the billboard. Mm -hmm. So Mike, I, I found what I was what I have been looking at before. It's under the central business and motor business with the illumination because those say it can be internal or external and then it goes on to talk about the source. Maybe it should just be clarified the source of external illumination shall not be visible because because that follows saying it can be internally or externally illuminated. Okay. Because then, because that. Okay. Yeah, that works. Well, the the source of internal is it the sign itself? So if it's really just referring to. That's great. That's okay. okay. Would you define again the difference between the internal and external? Make it a little clearer. I, internal illuminated. So if you have like the um, you know silk or vinyl, sir, you know the the sign itself on the outside. It's usually got a box. And there'll be a light on the inside okay. that, that lights it up, and so the sign is pretty much illuminated from the inside, so it glows out. We used to call them backlit. Isn't it like a backlit sign? It could be a yeah, yeah usually sort of, yeah. referred to as like box yeah. Yeah. type yeah. signs. But okay. and then the the external ones are the the ones that are just you know yeah. sign itself on a wall, and then they've got a light on the outside right. pointing up at the sign. Okay. Do you think there needs to be the clarification of the whole wall, how a wall is defined, which you never would have thought that would have to happen, but how with structures like the silos or if there was a dome or any kind of a spherical building, is the wall in that case a circumference or is it a visible face? Well, there could be the, yeah, the wall of the building in the historic district where you have painted signs in several places that are pretty large. Right. So I, I mean that's just a question of yeah. maybe for, for the attorney does wall need to be more clearly defined? Is it Kay. in the case of a an, an building without corners? Is it what yeah, defines I mean, a wall? I, I just yeah, and I think that you know our interpretation has always been that it's one really one continuous wall unless it changes direction um, you know I guess the the hard thing you know the hard part would be to say you have like a the typical square box is obviously easy because you've mm -hmm. got this corner does a 90 there's that wall 
Um, but if you've got a complete, you know, circumference around structure, at what point would you determine where the break would be? I, I mean, it would be <laughs> exactly. The, the That's be, right. I agree. And be. so, I mean, some uh, it could be a visible. I don't know, but I I think to define it just to pr sort of protect it, make it clear that if it's like we you said, if it's continuous without a change we in direction, or you're talking no. About. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's why it's yeah. because it came up, and that <laughs> I, I, I've heard that yeah. challenged. And well, why is that a wall? So yeah. you know, and it's um, I think it would be good to have that um, clear so that there's no question if it is you know a continuous without a change in direction. Maybe that should be one. Well, I mean, how do marquees fit in that? Well, or even, I mean, I'm, I also was thinking of like the Kibbe Dome, but we're right, not dealing right, with the right, signs right, over right. there. But something, so, you know, if you're doing that whole circumference of some dome shaped building, which could be built, that could be very large and you Skate can have a really big dome shaped. Well, that's true. Yeah. Sweet. We that one. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess that. In my mind, you'd still be allowed the same amount of signage, regardless of if it was square or round. It's just that if you're in a round structure, you could have all the signage on essentially one wall as opposed to dispersed on four if it was a square structure. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that would be the really the only difference in my mind would just be the amount I of agree. signage in one yeah, location. Yeah. Type, right, type and I guess thing. that would be the question of if the intent of limiting the size of a sign on the face of something is so that you don't have or whatever have someone decides is too big of a sign. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Hmm. Just maybe something. To yes. I mean, yeah. Rob. Um, something I struggle with as I look at these tables, and maybe as we are moving forward with this, what. It, what does a 32 square foot sign look like versus a 14 foot or a 120 square feet? I wonder if, and I don't want to create a whole lot of extra work, but it would be kind of fun or helpful, informative to mm -hmm. see some examples of what a 120 square foot sign looks like or a 64 square foot. And I'm wondering when they're permitting these, they must have drawings or um, photos or something that so uh, if at some point in time as we get to finalizing all this maybe just part of the presentation is give us some examples so that I can relate to mm -hmm. uh, sure. it's not that I have any expertise in how big a sign should be um, but I just kind of would like to have a sense of it's probably a good idea to uh, if, if you just make a drawing of something, it, it doesn't uh, say much, but if you put a, uh, a, a car or a... Come to give it scale. It, scale. Yeah. For scale, then it starts to mean something. Yeah. In other words, it's, a, it's longer than a car. Oh, <laughs> that long. <laughs> you know, and that most of us a have cabin. a rough idea of how big a parking space yeah. is. On, and uh, in my yeah, case, cool. the parking yeah, spaces are always too small. small. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't mean to create a lot of extra work for you. Just that. <laughs> yeah, we have some. I, yeah, I could pull up old permit records and and kind of give you an idea of what they okay. what size they are. I mean, you can almost guarantee that really any fast food chain along any of the highways is going to be about 100 square feet okay. because that's, that's the, the max. maximum that okay. we, we have. Um, so that they typically, you know, those freestanding signs, a lot of them are, are of similar size. Do you remember how big Tri-States was that caused us to lower the size of I think it was, signs? Uh, I think their sign's about 192 square feet, I think is what it came up to. And we be. brought it down to 100? Yeah. 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 Yes, because they had to add the landscaping. Uh, so we have the you know 100 square feet is the baseline, and then if you add um, you know enough landscaping, essentially 100 square like a 10 by 10 area underneath the base of it, you can achieve another 100 square feet. And so they were pretty close to I think the 200 square feet. Uh, it was yeah. it was about 190, I think. Hmm. Uh, I'm struggling with how the uh, um, on the residential. <laughs> paper uh, how the one per lot uh, one sign per lot uh, relate to 
political signs? Well, we'll have to. So right now we just have these are non-residential uses. Um, um, so these are just yeah. Oh, and so okay. we'll have to uh, go through portable. They're, they're probably going to be portable signs is how we define them. Um, we do have portable signs within commercial so like the other sheet that has permitted signs and commercial zones on the back side um, we, right now we go through the typical uh. portable sign is a sandwich board or freestanding banner sign those are the feather signs that we ended up uh, amending the code to include all uh, right yeah. so we'll have to figure out I mean we can't call them political signs anymore obviously <laughs> Or the um, real estate signs, so we'll. It's likely that they'll probably be called portable signs, and we'll have to figure out how we're going to fold those into yeah. the mix. Um, so yeah, that that's one item. I mean, I think this is, you know, in the residential areas, it pretty much covers most of the signs, but th that's really the big one that the court case ended huh. up drawing the distinction on. We'll have to figure out how we're going to treat portable, you know, portable signs yeah. on. I've occasionally um, had half a dozen at least. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and maybe it's that up until, you know, 60 days prior to the election, there is no limit on, on <laughs> you know, temporary portable signs on so residential properties. Curiosity, there's one over where I live. Somebody put one out very similar to a political sign that some must sell mattress moving. You know, and it's like I could care less that it's there, except that it's been there for a very long time. I'm sure they've moved now, and it's kind of like the art sale signs. Nobody takes them down; they put them up, but they don't take them down. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, occasionally things like that happen, and it's, most of us don't get excited over it. But you know, just where does that fit in? Because that's well, usually those are temporary banners, and so we have, a, I think, a, a duration. I think it's 30 days with another 30-day extension type of thing. Um, and so those are a lot of those signs, like grand opening. Um, oh, no, this is an individual in an apartment that wants to sell their mattress because they're moving. Mm -hmm. How large is it? It's like a political sign. Yeah. You know, and I'm tempted to just pull it out and toss it because it's been there so long. Surely they've start, sold that mattress by now or have moved, you, so. you know. But, you know, I don't want to interfere with anybody. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's like the yard sale signs. I don't know that anybody cares so much that they're on the telephone poles, but they never take them down. Right. Yeah. And if they would take them down, they wouldn't have an issue. Well, I, I mean, so that's going to be the question if we can't control the content that could be treated like any other free speech sign that you know well wherever you come from we're happy that you are our neighbors you know those those signs <laughs> um, and so it, you know it's gonna have to probably fit along the lines of some type of temporary portable sign that everybody in you know every residential property is going to be allowed to display I guess technically people can display hate signs then too huh I was thinking about that when we were talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, I, I don't have a... <laughs> yeah, it worries me. I mean, uh, yeah, there gets to be a point where you know, you're entitled to free speech, but, um, you know, not necessarily hateful type so well fortunately uh, you know we see the good ones around yeah. the way. I haven't seen any, any yeah. of what I'm talking about but I was wondering if it opens the door to that well so I yeah I can talk to our city attorney and, <laughs> and give an answer on that. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a difference between you you've put out everybody's welcome and you'll leave that out there for 15 years until it falls apart but I need I'm moving and I need to sell my mattress that <laughs> shouldn't be there for 15 years. Maybe it's not much different though than like the beat up couch that's out there for <laughs> 10 years in the yard. I don't know. You should just <laughs> wish that it would go away at some point. I don't know. Well, really, it becomes the landlord's responsibility. Yeah. I, mean, I can't tell you how many couches yeah. my husband takes to the dump and yeah, home. And there's, there's <laughs> <there's two. laughs> um, so. It's amazing how couches. Are a lot heavier <laughs> when you're leaving a, 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 an apartment <laughs> than they were when you're moving in. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, we're gonna we'll have to take a look at billboards. We'll have to take a look at um, you know our portable signs and how we incorporate real estate and uh, political signs and into that mix. Um, but for the most part, I, you know, it, we've kind of got the a good structure with the table, and then those are really the mm -hmm. three main yeah. sign types that we'll have to take a closer look at and see see what we can figure out. But yeah. But yeah, take a look. If anything else that just scanning through it jumps out at you, mm -hmm. like I said, there are a few blanks in here that we'll have to um, I, that right now our, our code just is silent on, like for instance, projecting signs in commercial districts. Um, the only district that we say that you're limited to one is just. Know, central business, urban mixed commercial, and general business, and and so I anticipate probably just filling in those other blanks. But um, just wanted to, before I just went ahead and filled them in, wanted to think about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, another one is getting back to portable signs. Um, you know, right now the primary portable sign that you see, especially downtown, is the sandwich board signs. Mm -hmm. Um, we require those to be directly in front of the business they serve, so we don't have them all over the place. Um, right now, the number of signs we have permitted is just one sign, so since thinking downtown, one sign per each 100 feet of building frontage. At least one sign should be permitted for each building. So we've had circumstances in the past where, you know, I mean, most buildings downtown have multiple, multiple businesses tenants. up yeah. on the second floor who always want to, um, you know, I mean, we haven't had that many issues, but I know that there has been one issue, you know, one that, I mean, you're entitled, so let's say there's multiple tenants in a building and the first one comes in and, and gets a permit for a sidewalks or a sandwich board sign, um, and then somebody else moves in, maybe in the prime retail space and comes in for another sign permit and wants a sandwich board sign of their own out front, um, it's tough because right now we just have it as you know instead of one per business yeah. it's one per building yeah for the most part and so you know that's just something we've observed over the years is you know it can get be pretty competitive especially downtown for the sandwich board signs and of course we don't want a proliferation of them either but um you know thinking about that as well Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've noticed, I won't mention names, uh, some where you've got your little cafe tables and stuff out front and the sandwich signs and more mm -hmm. than one of them, are, they're next door to each other and it does get kind of cluttered if you're trying to walk through there and if you're walking through there with strollers or in a wheelchair mm -hmm. or something like that, it comes an issue. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's supposed to be a certain... Clearance. Mm -hmm. And they're not necessarily. Yeah. And I know our city clerk that permits the sidewalk cafes um, has been intermittently going around and, and trying to enforce that. I mean, we have gotten a number of complaints. It's mainly, like you said, the ones where they have the sidewalk cafe and they have some type of fenced enclosure mm -hmm. like they're supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And then they have the sidewalk sign pretty much blocking the path <laughs> between yeah. the mm -hmm. you know furniture mm -hmm. zone and we it's have usually where yeah it's usually yeah. where we have street furniture yeah. and then the sidewalk cafe and then they put the sign right there because they want people to make a hard right right, <laughs> in, right <laughs> in their business. Yeah. Yeah. so th those are usually the ones we have a challenge with but technically they're required to maintain that for four to six feet of pedestrian clearance but it is nice. We our sidewalks downtown are fourteen Wide. to sixteen feet, yeah. so it, it really, yeah. you know, it's a lot more of a problem in places like Sandpoint that right. you know trying to right. uh, gentrify their downtown, but have kind of these narrow sidewalks down there. So Colfax, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so when the highway widened. Okay, so um, we'll just keep reviewing this and keep working on okay. filling in some of the blanks and taking a look at it and then we'll try to form the billboard and and political and real estate signs and take a look at them maybe next time. Okay, that sounds great. So we're just continuing with another draft next time. So um, the next item is continuing education and really um, last time we talked about trying to get some context for 
um, housing demand in Moscow and Connie sent out the housing report but then there was kind of a request from both staff and council to and, and we um, we had talked about maybe getting um, somebody to come present that information but uh, to wait until uh, City Council has a workshop on on the housing study so Brandy maybe you could just tell us what's happening with that a little bit and yeah um, yeah and I don't know that it's necessary to wait I felt that that the presentation we initially got was a nice like overview but I suspect that you're all gonna want more. And we're we're guys, you yeah, got it from the consultant, was, right? And I think that um, it was it was Paul who uh, Rob had talked to um, Connie and Paul, right? And he yep. had uh, offered to come, mm -hmm. Paul Kimmel, and um, give a presentation from that perspective. So I don't know is, it, um, but then there it, we also have to find out the parts that conform to Idaho law, maybe, so that we aren't just exploring down every alley one that doesn't apply. So. That was the um, other concern was to kind of see what the focus should be, and um, and I think Paul's eager to come talk if he no has some guidelines in that regard. So, okay. um, and I don't know. I mean, we had originally thought, oh, we could schedule something for the next meeting, but that might be too soon. So maybe we're looking at next year or something. I mean, what do you, what do you think, Victoria? Well, Having you're going to be look. Council's going to be looking at your major challenge areas, your mm -hmm. strategic planning and stuff. You'll be getting into affordable housing, and that's not going to happen until the first of the year too. So, if we don't yeah. get into it in any great depth, we would be able to take direction from you. Right. I mean, I think after that presentation, what the reason we're doing this follow up is okay. P part of this report was a lot of information of ideas of what could be done to address the issue, but that wasn't really a part of the presentation, and that's where we want to kind of focus more exploring that part of the report. Mm -hmm. um, the presentation given to the council was pretty cursory. Exactly. So that's so why I'm, I'm just not need sure that for us to work with. I, I know that you're going to want more than that. Mm -hmm. And, and who gave, was it the consultant who gave yes. the presentation? Okay, so it wasn't Paul Kimmel, so I don't know. Well, I, when, I talked tell to, us more. when I talked yeah. to Paul, he actually suggested that he'd have the consultant come back and, and give us an overview here, but you know, there's obviously some unresolved issues with respect to Idaho law. I, I've read the report, and it's pretty dense, mm -hmm. but it has very little... Um, information with respect to what Idaho laws are out there that that we need to I deal with. The other thing I would kind of like to see is um, a context of actionable items for planning and zoning. And that yeah. is, if we're, as we're Good looking point. into Good this, yeah. what kinds of things do we as a commission need to be looking at? So I'd like to see those things kind of come together mm -hmm. to the degree that we can. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think yeah, that I it's yeah. going to be an important thing to deal with. And I guess after spending some quality time with the report, it would be nice to have somebody come in and give us an overview mm -hmm. uh, so that we don't get lost in the hundred and how many pages yeah, uh, it's pretty uh, of the thing. So Right, right. And the, the initial thing we got, I think it was also a little bit uh, somewhat briefer than perhaps a second one might be because the... I haven't launched yet. The com complete thing hadn't been presented to all the different partner entities that had helped to fund it. So, uh, you know, it, it also was geared more towards what they learned about the demographics of the area and the income levels and the, the housing costs and, and shortage of affordable uh, housing. Just a better identification and understanding of what the problem is. But what I'm interested in and what I presume planning and zoning is interested in is how can you be a part of the solution yeah. right right um, yeah. and that's what yeah that presentation while it's in the dense report that you looked at that wasn't a part of that presentation so I would say I mean, if Paul or the consultant uh, that would be wonderful if they would want to come and say you know we're interested in more focus of an overview of the, the potential solutions and what might be 
options in the state, that would be great. Yeah, because it's mm -hmm. regional. So it's Washington and Idaho, mm -hmm. and you have totally different laws. Right. Mm -hmm. you know? right. And and the, reg the report is different regions even around here. Right, it does, it's not and, specific. And we don't build developments, and so what can P and Z do? Yeah. We don't build them. Right. So we're, we're trying to explore topics you know, for continuing ed still, I guess, is the bottom line. I just took three uh, for my annual license re renewal for architecture. I just took three continuing ed classes, and one of them was on form-based codes. And, you know, it, for architects, it was, it was pretty easy to digest, but I think it would be a little bit too... Um, W probably wouldn't be a <coughs> exactly appropriate, um, but it would be nice, I think, to find somebody. Who, and so then I started searching online for presentations or videos or something that wasn't a YouTube of, of a good presentation on defining what form-based codes are and just bringing, I think it's easier to have a presentation <coughs> about it with slides up there than to read an article about it. Um, and um, I was trying to figure out who would be good to do that or a good source for that and um, because I think that would be another potential topic that we had talked about a while ago and never really pursued. Um, but so we're define still... It, define that again because I'm the, not an architect. Oh, um, form-based codes are kind of an alternative that's becoming more and more popular in different locations as an alternative to just uh, Euclidean zoning like we have here. So it would, you know, it's instead of based on land use, it's it's really like you could. It's more what form is appropriate for that neighborhood, um, and in in sort of a cross section. And so you could have all kinds of uses potentially in a building that in a. I mean, this is just kind of in a nutshell that a um, regular zoning code would say, no, you can't have that. You can only have, um, uh, you know, motor business there, but it might be the form of the building. Or, uh, well, that's a bad analogy, but um, that it's not really defined by the use. It's defined by the, the appropriate scale and, and form of the building. So it, it, it has more latitude. It offers more latitude for mixed use. It, makes, it supports the idea of mixed use. Um, and, and also, you know, that usually they look at a whole cross-section through the community and, you know, starting in the rural zones, moving in towards the center, the form that you would want, uh, the form base for that area would change. It would get denser and it would get... Uh, we, yeah. yeah, we did talk about that, you know, I can't retain all this. I'm not an architect. I can't retain all this. Well, we I mean, of course I... Bit, yeah. yeah, yeah, we did a little bit, but, it, you know, I think I think it's something that would be a, a, an instructional um, area of study for people who serve on a planning and zoning commission because it really is the way a lot of jurisdictions are going. And, it, it, you know, so. yeah, I don't know. How do you feel about it, Mike? But um, I, you know, I... Definitely had studied it before, yeah. but um, I, I've never worked in anywhere that has really practiced it at all. I, I know that um, some communities in Idaho, like Post Falls, ended up hiring Andres Dewan oh, did to they? come oh, up. And, I didn't know that. And yeah. That cost know, a lot of bucks. They paid, paid them a lot of money, <laughs> and they established an option of using, uh -huh. they called it you know, smart code, yeah. and you, an option of using the smart code or just their traditional code. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think anybody ever used the smart code. Oh, really? They never, oh. you know, I think it was probably because they never went all in oh. on the model. They just made it optional. Oh, yeah. And then for what other, whatever reason, um, mm -hmm. they just didn't. You know, ended up not uh, yeah. working out for them. Mm. Yeah, but a lot more of an urban area than you know mm. people or communities have gone. Yeah, Miami, the whole that. city is form-based codes yeah. now. But they have uh, Dwayne or Plater Plater back right there in their backyard. So, yeah. um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Nels, have you seen a good synopsis anywhere of form-based codes? I haven't been paying attention the last several years, so I don't have an immediate thing on my... Uh, but <coughs> you should at least know that people, if you're really critical about uh, creative zoning, the zones that we've used in America aren't that... Uh, what they do is just try and protect people's investment. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with really, it, that's, that's the biggest deal. 
<laughs> so hundred thousand people, you know, and we don't have that here in Moscow because we have such a little amount of money, and we don't have the people that are the five hundred thousand dollar people. So they don't like to live next to hundred thousand dollar people, <laughs> you know, and so forth. <laughs> and so that makes a lot of zones really pitiful, and and it's in the big cities, Miami, uh, Chicago, whatever, uh, people have begun to th uh, think about it. And so form-based uh, zoning or neighborhoods has uh, neighborhoods. allows a kind of a more mixed thing yeah. where you're, you, you're looking at um, things that are, they don't have to be the same use. In other words, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, though we've You'd be surprised how many people in our town, you know, we haven't had uh, so many uh, new subdivisions recently, but the minute somebody wants to do a duplex <coughs> for a long time, people were just so worried. They would just see their daughter being raped or something <coughs> because somebody had a, uh, a duplex. And, uh, of course, uh, it's sort of uh, well, silly. Well, what we saw there for a while, me in the audience, I wasn't up here, right. was uh, uh, the nice big lot with the nice big house and then building on behind in the area behind and you get the twin homes or the townhouses. So all of a sudden, instead of having a neighbor in the backyard, you had lots of neighbors in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that well, was and, and uh, oddly <laughs> enough, that's exactly how I've lived for the last 40 years, mm -hmm. and that's always been... Well, you see it being built bigger. right now, because um, there, yeah, there was a lot, we had a sort of active public hearing with a lot of people mm -hmm. complaining, remember that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, I, I think there was sort of a, you know, this planning and zoning recommended that we not allow that change, because there was so much pressure and also it was a neighborhood that people thought they were going to have this big lot neighborhood but then council reversed our decision and it's going in now and I think it makes total sense to have smaller housing down along that road because you know it's not conducive to big right. lots um, and s big houses and but it, it is surprising that I, I mean I've lived by apartments of course all these years and it hasn't ruin my life. I would not like to look out my front door and see those, the same apartments that I, out my back door, I'm okay with them. But out my front door, I would prefer. Well, that's, that's the So way. that's the, the sense of, <laughs> right. of form-based zoning is that right. you try to get things that are similar. Looking at so each other. So that people feel like this is uh, the way we are, well, even though people on the other side or two blocks away are, are living in a slightly different an, Another example of that would be the rezone right near uh, Moscow Building Supply where there was a row of what, um, is it duplexes and um, a developer wanted to match those across the street and took a swath out of that huge commercial lot that affronts the highway so they could have <coughs> like housing facing each other instead of commercial, you know. And so we did a rezone on that part of the property it was probably three or four years ago, I don't yeah. remember. And that would be another example kind of what you're talking about that, um, you know. That, and well, again, well, one, of the, yeah. one of the potentials but it's a problem with uh, Moscow because we don't grow in big. We since we don't have so much money, we don't grow in the uh, in the same way as the big cities do. But if we uh, could talk some of the people who own the land around Moscow into doing right, I know. some uh, planning with the Duanes or the other uh, yeah. good planners, then. It's just like the trailer park. If you have a plan and you know what the roads are gonna be like and you know how they're gonna be wide or big and lots are gonna be, if they're already pre-designed, then you can guide the growth. And uh, it's a really exciting thing to do. <coughs> so it would be, there are two or three, <coughs> three owners uh, in the outskirts of Moscow. But if we could talk them into that kind of, of proactive planning, rather than just, 
In other words, it might be a plan that <coughs> you don't uh, actuate. It'll, or, it'll take you 25 years to finish it up, but at least you know what the basic uh, 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 plans are. We, we don't do that much. You know, I always go back to my old favorite uh, New York City, where in 1811, they, the commissioners in the city of, uh, of New York laid a grid on the They did it in island. Seattle, too. I mean, look and at Seattle. And they said, this is the way oh, our town's going to grow. Yeah. But well, you can imagine John Jacob Astor at the time owned probably hundreds and hundreds of acres of that land, and he didn't like it much because they, they said, we're going to just lay this grid on here, and this is the way it's going to be, and it, and it turned out that way. And Astor fought them because he said, you can't tell me what to do. But they did, <laughs> and, uh, and, and it turned out to be uh, an amazing uh, story uh, of how uh, New York grew. And I've often wondered if we could, you know, as you look at some of the land outside of town, there are two or three names that come up, um, people that we think might own some of that, uh, if we could get them involved. So that would be a thing that if, if our continuing education could somehow train ourselves a little bit and invite some of those people to come and talk with us, it would be a, a proactive thing that P and Z might do. Right. You, you know, well, you could always. We, we planned. Uh, we planned West A Street and zoned it to be uh, motor business, <laughs> and uh, the. Uh, uh, Didn't quite work out. The, <laughs> the 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 money in uh, in residential development was stronger than our zoning. <laughs> Uh, so it's we not didn't, residential. We, we didn't design yeah. lots so much as we did zones. Yeah. We, we designed a zone, and the zone was in conflict yeah. with the pressures. Yeah, and form-based code sort of looks at neighborhood character more than it looks at land use as a, mm -hmm. as a single entity, which is kind of a... Um, so if we could find a, a re some really good way to even introduce form-based uh, zoning to the group, it wouldn't be back. Yeah, and I'm, I, I, I'm I exploring it. some really little 40-minute or 30-minute uh, video that somebody's made. Well, I'm looking for it. I've been, <laughs> search I've been searching for it, but I want other topics, too. I mean, that was one I was thinking about just yeah. as I continuing that. So if anybody... Our, uh, uh, Rob and I, you know, are <laughs> trying to, <laughs> to figure out a, a program. So if you can think of well, we, other topics, we set up like a whole page of goals. And yeah, we did, yeah. didn't we? Yeah, we did. I wonder where and that is. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought it with me forever, and then I stopped bringing it with me for for continuing that. Yeah, yeah, we, we, yeah it was like twenty five different things we listed. Why is my memory not And I, I have it in a special little folder, well, so we, I can lay my hands a, on a, it in a, a second. kind of a planning session, and we... Yeah, 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 yeah we, we could do that. Flip charts oh, we yeah. did the flip charts. Oh, yeah, because yeah. you were yeah. writing, and we were talking, yeah, oh, and that was a couple no years idea. ago. I'll see if I can... <laughs> Are you the keeper of the charts? I think I, I, yeah, I think I have it somewhere. No, maybe... Yeah, yeah, so it probably time. showed up in minutes somewhere. You typed it up. You typed it up as a rough list. Yeah, that's right. You were doing the flip charts, and we were doing a... I have it in this red folder. But we also need to kind of know what's coming up through the, you know, from the city in terms of issues. Well, I think the housing study would be the best one. Yeah, okay. I think we should probably focus on that. What stimulated this housing study? Uh, well, I think it came out of the Partnership for Economic Prosperity. Um, was the well, that would be Gina. Yeah. And, and a VISTA maybe held hands? Well, yeah, there was a number of entities I think that contributed Mm -hmm. To it, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, it was it was trying to I guess find some solutions for affordable housing in the region. Because we haven't seen many uh, new subdivisions just recently, have we? Mm -hmm. nope. It seemed like there was a rash of them. I mean, we we had a moment in we had a, several years when it was just uh, all, we'd have things. Was it catch up from to, from the and re maybe recession? We, you know, know, maybe and we then got now, ahead of yeah. ourselves, and maybe. The but but the housing study starts to say that the, there's a shortage. So you know. I feel that whole yeah. point of that was really a housing assessment, and multiple mm -hmm. entities contributed 
to make that happen, including the city, Pullman, the counties, the universities. Mm -hmm. So the, the focus of that report, well, the idea is, okay, you need a really comprehensive assessment as a first step. So now that's done. So now I feel like planning and zoning is very appropriate to, to help to implement now that there's a better understanding of uh, what the challenges are. Now that next step of education where planning and zoning can come in is what, what can you implement? I mean, even some of the things that you have been doing. We, I think we have to know what the challenges are that are in the study, though, don't you think? Before we know what we can implement. What's your time yeah, I mean, to give yeah, us yeah. a... a <laughs> You go on and study it and come back and tell us a good part. Well, why don't, I don't mean to at all say you should <laughs> oh, look back on having the presentation. I mean, that's... I think that would be a good place to start. Yeah, I, like. I, think, I, I think that would be good. I, I just, just know it's hard to get people in this group to read because yeah. I tried. No, I think the presentation is <laughs> no great. No offense, everybody. What I would <laughs> suggest, what I yeah. would love is to yeah. say, and can you... Um, devote a little bit of it to specifically addressing some of what's I, in that report I think about potential advice. solutions and yeah. what yeah. Um, so we what could get into target through planning it really and zoning needs to be might focused be able to implement as a planning right, and zoning right, right. action right plan yeah. so what can we plan. take because out of it that's right exactly so yeah. Yeah. getting a more targeted and presentation. you know thinking about with the the tiny home videos yeah. you know in that last right one too where they they're not required to be owner occupied is how I understood that in the in Fresno and that whole presentation, right? So but mm -hmm. here planning and zoning has recommended that the accessory dwelling units, the requirement is owner occupied. So, you know, which kinds of these things are acceptable here in Moscow that you would all recommend and which ones would you say this is not right for our community, like you've you've done with that, um, making lifting some regulations or in the process of for the ADUs, but some other things that you feel well, this is something we don't want to change. Right. And exploring all those other ideas and which ones of these are appropriate for our community from all of your experience and expertise and seeing and how Well, it's very work. different if you have uh, a recreational town versus a, a university town mm -hmm. versus a uh, what factory town or you know right so I think some of the options in there you may all say not not a good option for Moscow or right. others say this is where I think we should focus and mm -hmm. I think that would be very beneficial to have you involved but in so advising. would you prefer do you think we should wait though until the council has its workshop or should we try to schedule well, you have um, limited time between. Yeah, we just have one more meeting this year, so if we were going to have anybody, if we we're going to have Paul come, and he did offer to come, right? It was Paul. Who well, he was going to he was going to have the consultant. Oh, come. he was going to have the consultant. Yeah. Okay. It wouldn't hurt. It's not a long. It was maybe fifteen minutes or something. That will give you that background, that you know has led us to want to go more in depth into that second part, which surely. You know that can come later, but then you'll be caught up to speed if, if the timing works out. But yeah, no, I mean it, it sounds like it needs to be a series or a <coughs> sequence of presentations. Yeah, but right. starting with just maybe an introdu introductory one of um, you know how what parts seem to be the most relevant to planning and zoning of the report and, uh, and the findings or whatever. Um, I would try to focus it to planning and zoning. Yeah. Whoever whoever talks to us, not not try to be all things right. to all people. No, it's a big That's report. Yeah. <laughs> so in 15 minutes, they would so have to target anyway. So what is this workshop? I mean, what's the purpose of having the workshop? Well, what it really it back when the request was made by Pep for the city of Moscow to partially fund this and they went to all the different entities part of the discussion that we had as a council when we ultimately said yes we will fund it but we we want to do something with it it's we didn't want that to be the end of that investment um, just right. having an assessment report I think the the consensus was it will be worth the investment as long as we do something with that and it's more than just data of what the problem is. We want to use that data to then move forward and try to identify solutions. So that's that the workshop or whatever we do next. It's kind of like, okay, PEP did their work. 
they, the consultant did their work, we've got this report, now it's up to us to do something with it. And what the are we going to do with it? report had to be something more than what we already knew. I remember that being mm -hmm. stressed. We already know there's a housing shortage. Don't, don't just tell us what we right. already know. Give us data to work with. And we requested from that consultant um, ideas of what has worked in other communities to address the issue. So that's why there's, there's a lot of yeah, things in there. So now it's there. okay. I, it, um, discussing, evaluating which of these options you know, running it through all of you. And so let me make this suggestion, because I, I think this is going to be an incremental kind of a thing, and I, I agree with Mike that let's kind of keep our focus on that. Not that we sh shouldn't look at some other issues. It's not exclusive, but I'll go to that workshop. Um, if Because you'll be here. I'll yeah. be here. I'll go to the workshop. Let's start with the next meeting, and I'll report out the workshop and where Perfect. council thinks this is going great that'll great. give us some direction great and then we'll work at bringing either the consultant or paul or i mean victoria was on the committee so i mean we've got a lot of resources that so the rather than trying to have them come and address us next meeting let's let's get a sense of of <laughs> where council thinks it's going and then then we'll look at doing something at the next so when's, the when's the council worship? <coughs> well, December 2nd. What I'm not clear on is if it is technically going to be a freestanding yeah. separate workshop or if it is going to be more of an agenda item of probably a recap of a presentation. Will it be recorded in any case? Will it be public? Well, it will be public. It will, you know, uh, if it's outside of the council meeting, I'm not sure if it would be. But if it's going to go to council on the agenda, it's going to have to go through one of the committees the week prior, correct? It doesn't have to. No. It doesn't have no. to. No. Okay. And okay. if it's a workshop, it's not necessarily recorded. Well, I'll stay in the loop on that. Because I would attend. I attend all those mm -hmm. things. I would yeah. attend it. Yeah. I just don't know anything about it at this point. Well, unfortunately, I'll be out of town, but I would like to know, find a way to kind of find out what the So, it, I mean, is, is that okay as a first step? Yeah, perfect. Step that's we'll, great. We'll I think that's, that a, I think that's a good solution. Okay. Just, you know, it gives it, I, it, yeah, we started down this road, and then it was like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have, yeah. and so now um, um, I think it's, next, it's a good one. Next step. Yeah, so okay. let's just sequence it, and it sounds good. Okay, so next item is Transportation, uh, Joel, uh, Transportation Commission. There. Transportation Short Commission last met on October 10th. So you meet and tomorrow. And I already reported on that <laughs> yeah. one. Uh, the next meeting of the commission will be in this room uh, tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and the agenda indicates that uh, well, there's two major items. Uh, one uh, of the uh, tra Transportation Safety Improvement Grant Program Overview. Um, so, it's quite, they're looking at various safety improvement uh, possibilities, and we'll get a report. Uh, the second item is a consideration of the uh, uh, D Street and Main Street intersection, with the possibility of a uh, turn lane and uh, it's not not clear from the description here whether it's a northbound turn lane or a southbound turn lane or both. Hmm. But uh, we'll we'll be briefed on that. Hmm. Do, do you know? I would say south. Isn't there it's already a north? There north is. Yeah. Well, maybe there will there be. There is a northbound. North. It's it's northbound off of D. Okay. Eastbound D turning northbound onto the highway. Okay. Oh. Hmm. Eastbound right now, I mean, one road. goes straight and one goes left. Yeah. 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 And mm -hmm. you were thinking of a third th something, huh? Taking yeah. part of Walgreens out? Yeah. Cut into <laughs> Walgreens, <laughs> uh, cut into the. With the something to um, help with that backup that gets around the corner. By the recycling Rosars. center. Yeah. Well, yeah, because mm -hmm. people have discovered that they can avoid Third Street and the whole mess downtown by going around that way. Um, well, there is no turn yeah. lane there now. There's just one lane. Yeah, it's just one lane and parked cars in the other lane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's probably what will disappear. On D, there's only car. one lane. <laughs> well, to go know. left or straight. Um, but yeah, you can go uh, 
Well, the you east. can have two cars uh, as you go <coughs> onto the highway from D. It, not and when one, you're in, when right you're going lane, east? The right goes straight. To over to Rose Hours and the left. She's talking about the other east, direction. East, east, east going eastbound, coming bound. the other way. Coming from, oh, oh, you know, it goes all the way past Hunga Dunga sometimes. Are, yeah, yeah, that's a bike. vast yeah. uh, issue for us because yeah. uh, mm -hmm. people have decided They've discovered to do that, that little zigzag. Right. Thing. They've discovered and, uh, my yeah. route that I used to get around <laughs> down now. Now yeah. everybody does it. They, uh, <laughs> yeah. There's fast driving yeah. people who want to go out to Canterwood. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're already driving 35, 40 miles an hour because they think yeah. they're going to go straight through. And other people are turning. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And th now we're going to have a big building right there, yep. uh, right in front of our traffic. Better do something before the building gets there. That's <laughs> just, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, just as a, uh, a passing comment, I was stunned to see Hog Creek show up and then disappear again. Where did you know? it show up? Well, Hog Creek comes into the corner of where the new building is, uh, yeah. and they dug it out, and here's this great big flume, oh. and then water, and then I they, they, they uh, put a four-foot tunnel underneath oh. the whole new property oh. heading oh. across the way. Oh. And uh, I swear to God, I'd never seen Hog Creek before. I have a picture of it right here. <laughs> <laughs> And there it was, yeah. just water sitting there, kind of looking murky. Yeah. 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 And, now, and, and then up to 48 hours later, it was all gone. Oh. So is, that, see how is that a larger yeah. conduit? What? Is it, is it a larger huge. conduit that huge. went in there? No, it seemed to be the same size. Four it foot is. seemed to be what It is exactly the same size. The same size. Because there's right. been discussion anyway, about whether the whole conduit's I too was small. Just, <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> help myself. I jumped out of my car and went running over because <laughs> I've heard about Hog Creek oh, for yeah. all yeah, 40 yeah. years and I never saw it. <laughs> well, we've been over the top of it for the last 25 and we hadn't seen it either. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's certainly part of Moscow's history. It was yeah. one of the things that yeah. brought people here. Okay, so, I'll, uh, um, I'll, I'll report on the intersection yeah. uh, discussion uh, next meeting. Great. That will That'd be, be interesting to find out. Are there any other announcements? That's the last item. All right, so um, we will have a report from Rob at the next meeting, and uh, um, we'll see you in December. Super. Yeah. And happy Thanksgiving. Everybody. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Yes, we will. Meeting adjourned. Thank see you. See anybody before.